There are many things, indeed several things, that can and do interfere with the peace of the believers in Christ. There are also biblical means to guide against these things. Yes, from stealing the peace of the believer. Yes, we shall address one of these things that tend to steal peace of the believer. It does not only steal peace, but has ruined many lives. It has and continues to be a major obstacle. Yes, for many, preventing them from entering into the kingdom of God. However, the Lord has made provision for his children to recognize, resist, and overcome the allures of this very powerful entity. As believers in Christ, we ought to always avail ourselves of the means the Lord has provided for us to successfully navigate our way through the minefield that is in the world. Yes, many of us might not be thinking in that term, but indeed, the reality is that the world is like a minefield for the average believer. It takes the wisdom and the grace of God to successfully walk through the minefield without being uh, maimed, injured, or even becoming a victim. And so, truly, the Lord wants all his children to finish the race set before them triumphantly. And so, the title of this video is One Thing to Do to Have Peace of Mind. One Thing to Do to Have Peace of Mind. You see that beautiful cat there? That cat is at peace. If you ask me, I will say it is even so thankful to God that it seems to be in the prayer mode. Thanking God, you ought to also be able to be at peace. Why? Because the Lord has made provision for your peace. And so, to the word of God, we turn now for help. Yes, to help us so we do not fall victim to the powerful entity. Yes, we now turn to the word of God. The Holy Scriptures. And so the word of God to guide us is as in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. And I read, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. For lay up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. May the Lord bless his words in our hearts in Jesus' name. The background to that passage is that the Lord was teaching his disciples, you know, and that passage of scripture that is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, which covers from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. The Lord had been teaching his disciples on the Mount on majorly the characteristic traits of the people of the kingdom of heaven. Immediately preceding our passage, he taught them about fasting. Fasting has to do with the believers bringing his body under control. The Lord then moves from the area of self-control to the area of our substance, our inner state and attitude which we manifest externally 
as we engage in our activities of daily living. Thus, he spoke to the stranglehold the treasures possess over it the hearts of their owners. This is a core issue here. How a person's treasure possesses his heart to his own ruin. And so that's what the whole passage is about. And so we go now to the first verse of our text. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. <clears throat> which tells us, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Yes. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. That's a command. The Lord was commanding. He was not suggesting. He was not just giving an opinion. Remember, he was speaking to his disciples. These are people who had already believed in him. They were already in the kingdom. And so he was telling them, lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth. To lay up is to put away something safe and secure. To put something away means first that you have acquired it. You own it, it's in your possession. Yes, it belongs to you. So this is your own thing over which you have the right, authority, and power to use as you please. And so you lay it up, you store it, or you keep it safe. In this wise, the specific thing being spoken about or being spoken of is treasure. Treasure is well that is stored up or hidden. It is something that is of exceptional value and is kept safe by the owner. So treasures are things the person considers of great value and therefore important. The truth is everyone has treasure. The quantity, the quality, and the variety may, be, may differ. But the truth is there is no person without some treasure. And so it's a specific location being spoken of upon earth. That is here in the earth. Remember, we're all on earth. The disciples are not believers. And indeed, all human beings live on earth. And do, we all do our activities here on earth. Again, that's what God purposed. Remember what he said. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth had he given to the children of men. Psalm 115 verse 16. And so, Human beings are the rightful residents of the world. This is where we do our thing. <clears throat> so the disciples were commanded to not lay up their treasures on earth. We are in the world, though as believers in Christ, we are not of the world, according to John chapter 15, verse 19. Also John 17, 14, and then verse 16. And for now, whatever we do, we do it in the world. The things we need and want are for our use in this world. Hence, we all tend to think in terms of the world. And whatsoever we consider as being valuable to us, we want to keep in a safe place. Not only that, but we also frequently check to see such things are still there and safe. The earth is not a safe place for earthly treasures. Hence, it cannot be a safe place for real treasures. Things that make the earth not a safe place for earthly treasures are then spoken of. And so, the reason why the Lord was commanding his disciples not to lay up treasures for themselves on earth are now given. Where moth and rust dot corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. There is a lot of debate among scholars as to what the moth is, what rust is and uh, corrupt and all that. But here we shall not be engaging in any needless or endless um, 
debate like scholars who claim to know but they can never agree among themselves. However, moth is representative of insects and other pests. They eat material things. Many of us have experienced you know, the activity one way or the other. They ruin the materials they come in contact with, you know, for example, clothes, wooden items, and so on. Remember also, the, the same word here used, as, um, interpreted as moth, is also the same that is used to name the waster in Isaiah 50 verse 9 and also 51 verse 8. And so, uh, moving from the figure of speech to reality, moths are wasters in a sense that they eat clothes, they eat wooden items, and make them become useless to their owners. And rust, as we see, we were told there, is corrosion that destroys metals. Rust is corrosion that destroys metals. It's the process of producing rust that tarnishes metals by oxidation. Eating. Disease are some other things that are used to describe rust or used in the term of rust in scripture as well. Remember, corrosion breaks down the metal into a caricature of itself, thereby, thereby making it useless and valueless. Again, there are certain metals that man consider to be precious and of value, but then they are rendered useless once they begin to get rusty. For people to go into extraordinary lengths to refine these various metals, to obtain as pure a form as is possible, but even at the end, to lose it to a rust will be more of wasted effort and resources. And so, corrupt, it speaks there of corruption. To corrupt is to destroy the value or use of something. To completely ruin it. Again, when it is spoken of, this is a very commonly used word in scripture. For example, there are people who try to corrupt the word of God. What are they trying to do? They are trying to destroy the word of God. How did they do that? They add a little bit of the word of God to a whole load of falsehood. In the process, the word of God becomes unrecognizable. And so, this is exactly what moth and rust we do to whatever becomes their victim. So, corruption is the result of the activities of moth and rust. That is, they both render the objects of their actions worthless for their owners. All such precious metals can be corroded and thus corrupted, thus rendering them valueless and useless. So we need to understand this. Both moth and rust are representative of natural destroyers of earthly goods. Others will include tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunami, floods, and other natural disasters with their immense power destroy on a very large scale. Their destructive effects were they to occur within the treasury of a person will be serious damage and great loss to the treasury of that person. And where thieves break in and steal. Okay, uh, assuming even the treasures are kept safe from this natural pest and destroyers. There are human beings also, whom you, the, the, the owner of the treasure, have to reckon with. A thief is someone who steals what belongs to another. And usually, the, the thieves are full of all manner of tricks and schemes to ensure success in their attempt to steal other people's things. So they break in through security barriers on there to steal. They watch for the power owner's unguarded moment to break in. So another danger to treasure in this case is that unlike the moth and um, the rust, the thieves 
carries away the treasure completely. Yes. He carries it, he, he, whoever it is, they carry the treasure away completely. So, in this way, it is complete loss. The owner, most times, will not be able to trace the goods and they will never be found. In the case of thieves, they come to steal what is valuable and they take it away completely. Yes, thieves are human beings clever and wicked they watch and steal when the owner is off guard and all they want is to take away without permission and through deception falsehood or outright force whatever belongs to another person but which they desire many owners of treasure come to bodily harm and even death ruin burglaries and so the question arises, what are your treasures or things precious to you? This is more of a personal question because uh, we all have different ideas of things that are precious to us. But as I said before, in reality, there's nobody that has no treasure. It's the quantity and the, the, the quality and the variety that may differ. For example, your treasure, a person's treasure may be money lots of money a person's treasure may be landed property you know, real estate will be chains of companies will be position or power uh, uh, so it can be seriously individualized so the next question would then be will you store your treasures where they are not safe I want you to pause and consider that question that were you to have the option, will you store your treasure in a place that is not safe? So recognize also in all of this, the greatest of, thief, of all thieves is the devil. Yes, the power is the power behind the lower level thieves in the devil, you know, in the world. The devil is the real master. He has many foot soldiers, although many of them do not think or even uh, want to associate with him. Many of them think they are independent in what they do. But the truth is, they are just low level soldiers who are working for the devil without knowing. As our Lord said, the thief cometh not but to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. In other words, the devil does not have your interest at heart. The moth, the rust, the thieves, all do not have your interest at heart. They are after taking what is precious to you. The only one who has your interest at heart and who wants those things to be preserved, who give, gives their, them to you in the first place, is the Lord. Again, do remember from this verse 19, every material thing on earth is subject to decay and loss. Verse 20 goes on to tell us, but lay up your for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So, verse 20 is exactly the opposite of verse 19. Again, it is a command. God, the Lord was giving them the option. The Lord says, don't do this, but do this one. So they are not to lay their treasures on earth, but lay up your treasures in heaven. And the exact reason why they should not lay up their treasures on earth is the reason why they should lay their treasures in heaven. So, because why on earth? Moths 
rust, thieves, and other things destroy treasures. Those things do not exist in heaven. Heaven is the abode of God and his holy angels. It is safe. There are no corruptors there. Yes, no corruptors in heaven. Whether natural, whether spiritual, or human, heaven is a safe place. So the Lord commands his disciples to lay up their treasures in heaven. So verse 21 continues. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the cross of the matter, the core of the whole thing. Why heaven is preferred for the storage of treasures than earth. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, this is everyday experience of every human being. Where you are in this wise, the Lord was talking to the apostles, although by extension all believers and indeed all human beings. Treasure is wherever, whatever you consider precious to you, will always occupy your heart. Your mind will always be there. You will show concern. You will also demonstrate your love. In, all, in the way you, you, you think of that thing that is precious to you. So this verse speaks of the habits and experience of all human beings, not just believers. And please don't deceive yourself and say, no, you, have, um, you, 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 you are not like that. Remember, God created man and he knows the heart of men. So he knows our hearts much more than we do. The truth, the fact is, where what we consider as precious to us is, here will our heart be also. And so we see here, the heart refers to the entire, to the center of the being of a person. It involves the emotion, the act of reasoning, and the will. It's the decision-making place for a man. And so we see man centers his heart upon whatever he considers as his treasure. If your treasure is laid up on earth, there will your heart be. And as believers in Christ, as people of the kingdom, we are supposed to be minding heavenly things. If your heart is on earthly things, on earth, you are then earthly minded. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 48 But if your heart is on heavenly things laid up in heaven then you are heavenly minded again 1 Corinthians 15:48 So the Lord was again letting his disciples know where they should focus their heart and what could cause that focus to shift so, but we cannot physically take anything out of the earth, nor can we take anything into heaven, as we are told in the scriptures. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Like that, Job 1, 21. And more bluntly, we are told, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. First Timothy 6, 7. And so then, why was the Lord telling his disciples to lay up treasures in heaven? This we shall address further, possibly, in another video. But right now, let's stick to this passage of scripture. Matthew 6, 19-21. So, the Lord is letting us know about the lives, life of the believers. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples about the life of the believers in Christ in the first half of Matthew chapter 6, specifically Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 18. It, it tells us details of how the life of the believer should be. 
Then he goes on to speak of the dangerous behaviors. The dangerous behaviors that could affect believers in Christ. That is from Matthew chapter 6 verse 19 to Matthew chapter 7 verse 5. He taught them about behavior that could impact them negatively. These behaviors are dangerous because of potential harm to the believers. And so they were being warned about this. And the Lord warned his disciples of such behavior as could lead to spiritual failings and nullify their witness. This behavior or activity or attitudes include their attitude to possessions, including money, worry about material things, hypocrisy, on and on onto judgmental attitude towards others. He warned them against these attitudes that have led to the ruins of many people. At the base of this is man's tendency to hoard, man's tendency to acquire and accumulate and refuse to share. You know, so there are several truths presupposed by the command of the Lord. Yes, check yourself. How many things you have in excess? How better do you think they can, they can be used? Remember again, the term treasures implies the addition or accumulation of things. Human beings love to accumulate and to hurt things. Remember again, no one is exempt from this tendency. So don't say because you're a believer in Christ. In fact, this idea of it doesn't apply to me or I'm exempt has led people to become careless and to, have been, to become snared in things they, they would otherwise have uh, you know, escaped where they you know, to be more vigilant, where they to be more honest with themselves. There are too many believers who are holding themselves up too high of a standard beyond what they truly are. And many has thereby been tempted into things that otherwise they could have prevented had they been aware of their true status in their faith. Remember again, disciples have treasures. Such treasures could be and were known. This is what, again, what we can de 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 decipher from this passage. The Lord will not be telling them to lay up things they don't have, or the things they have or they don't know they have. So, they had treasures. They knew what those treasures are. And they know that these treasures are the treasures acceptable to the Lord. The Lord will never ask them to lay up what is not acceptable to him. So these treasures could be stored. Again, remember, it is those who are of the kingdom that have been given access to the things of the kingdom. So the disciples will know what the Lord was talking about. If stored on earth, the same fate that befalls earthly treasures will befall them. Hence, they were to be taken care of with special precaution. What's that special precaution? Not to be stored on earth, but to be stored in heaven. There is a means of storing these treasures in heaven. His disciples knew how to store their treasures in heaven. The treasures are only safe in heaven. You watching this video, do you know your treasures? Do you know how they can be stored in heaven? Remember again, because their hearts will be where their treasures are stored. These were disciples. They were not exempt from this innate desire, this innate attitude of human beings to focus on their treasures. And so the Lord was not being complacent, but confronted this thing in the life of the disciples. 
the Lord was not assuming that, oh, because they are disciples now, they will just automatically focus their hearts on, the, on heaven. No. The Lord brought it to their attention that they are not exempt from this powerful influence. And so he was letting them know their heart should not be on earth. They should not store their treasures on earth. Rather, they should store their treasures in heaven. Remember again that earth is a hostile environment to believers. If you are a genuine child of God, you will know that the world is a hostile environment to you. You would have experienced certain things, not because of what you have done, but simply because of your faith in Christ. Remember, though not of the world, the believers are called out from the world. John 15, 19. And because believers are not of the world, the world hates them. Again, the same passage of scripture. The world hates them because the believers believe in Christ, who has given them the word of God. John 17, 14. Please understand all this. The world hates not only the believer, but also their message of the gospel of Christ and of the kingdom of God. So the believers are not of the world, as Christ their Savior and Lord is not of the world. Not only that on earth, but mort and rust corrupt, and thieves break in and steal. In addition to all that danger, the world hates the believers intensely. And so the question comes, why will you, the believer, lay up your treasure in hostile territory where you are hated intensely? I'm sure you will agree with me that it, it does not make sense. If that thing is truly precious to you and you want to keep it safe, you will not keep it safe in enemy territory. It's important for us to recognize this, that lives have been ruined by inordinate love of treasures. Yes, there are many examples. Again, it's, it's important for us to uh, 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 remind ourselves again, the problem is not the treasure, it is the inordinate love of the treasure. And so there are many examples of people who have allowed the love of money or wealth or treasure to ruin their life or faith and nullify their witness. Here are a few examples, and I'm sure you can add many more. Achan, son of Kami, in Joshua chapter 7. Achan was a soldier of Israel. Israel had just defeated Jericho. They dedicated the whole of Jericho as a spouse of war to the Lord, as, you know, as God had commanded them. They were not to take anything. Everything was to be destroyed as devoted to the Lord. But Achan contravened the commandment of the Lord. As he stole a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 pieces of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. Hear him as he gave the details of his sin. He said, when he was confronted eventually, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. We see that word they there, coveted and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Joshua 7, 21. His action led to the initial defeat of Israel by I. Achan was eventually identified as a culprit whose sin brought misfortune of defeat upon the whole of Israel. He and his family were stoned to death for his sin. Joshua 7, 25. There is a story of the rich young woman 
who encounter Jesus Christ, as recorded in Matthew 19, verses 16 to 29. So, as we were told, one came to the Lord Jesus Christ and wanted to know what good thing to do to have eternal life. The Lord directed him to the Ten Commandments. The young man claimed to have kept them from his youth up. He then asked for that what else he lacked to gain eternal life. The Lord then told him to sell what he had, give the proceeds to the poor, and then come to follow him. Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven. See that phrase again. Treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Matthew 19, 21. But well, what did we see? But the young man did not accept what the Lord said. And he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Apparently, the rich young man preferred to continue to hold on to his possessions than to have eternal life. This is also the choice of numerous people today. They would rather hold on to the things, as people say, they can see, than to speak of uncertain things. Again, another example, Ananias and Sapphira. This couple lied to the Lord about the amount of money they sold their land. Remember, as they were told, which is the truth, before they sold the land, it belonged to them. It was their decision to sell the land. After selling the land, it still the money belonged to them. And so they were not under compunction. But their problem was they pretended that they had given the full price they sold the land, the, the, the cost of the land to the church, while they cut back a portion. And so they were judged instantly with death for their hypocrisy. Again, because of the love of money. Demas were told, again, Demas was a companion of Apostle Paul in the work of ministry. The Apostle even referred to him as one of my fellow laborers, Philemon 24. He was even commended by the Apostle on occasion. However, he deserted because he loved the world as the apostle wrote, For Demas had forsaken me, having loved this, this present world, and is departed from unto Thessalonica. In other words, again, see the word there, loved this present world. It's not that he went to Thessalonica now on mission. It is because of his love for the present world. Perhaps, this is my own thinking now. It might be one of the false teachers that were troubling the people in Thess that went to trouble the people in Thessalonians. So the word of God states clearly, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. First John two verse fifteen. Mark you. The trend continues today. Many people continue to covet and love this present world. They continue to put the care of the world above the need for sound biblical teaching. It's very important for us to recognize one barometer of righteousness. Again, when we look at Matthew 6, 19-21, the world, they, 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 the law was not against the world. You will see why as we proceed. Rather, it's the attitude of a person towards treasure. Wealth, that is one of the barometers of righteousness. The way a person 
views and uses words is a window to what is in the person's heart. Remember again the, the four examples given here. On the surface of it, one would say that Achan was a loyal soldier of Israel. But until he came face to face with the option of obeying or disobeying God, and he chose to disobey, you will then realize that his heart was focused on treasures. Similarly, Ananias and Sapphira. And when you look at the case of the rich young man, the thing that did not allow him to enter the kingdom was his preference for his possession. His love for his possession above his desire to have eternal life. So the way a person views and uses wealth is a window to what is in the heart. True people of God, we need to recognize this. True people of God have power over their wealth. Remember, like sin, we are told, sin no longer has dominion over a true child of God. In other words, stop lying to yourself and saying the devil, or you, you, you couldn't help it. When you sin, the Bible says it is your choice. If you are a genuine believer, you did not fall into sin. You deliberately sinned. And that could be a sign that truly you are not a believer. Sin does not have controlling power over a true child of God. That does not mean you cannot sin. But if you are a true child of God, when you sin, it will be truly an accident. It will be truly a mistake. And the Spirit of God will convict you that you have done wrong. You will lose your peace and you will want to immediately, as soon as possible, make peace with God by confessing and forsaking that sin. And so it is the same that if you are a true child of God, wealth, treasures, whatever you have acquired in the world, will have no controlling power over you. And so your wealth will not dominate you. And you will demonstrate your power over your wealth, not the wealth's power over you, by a detached attitude. Yes, you will recognize straight away that your wealth is useful. Yes, you will recognize the importance and usefulness of your wealth only as a tool to deploy in the service of the kingdom of God and the betterment of God's creation. Yes, the appetites of true people of God are governed by moderation and readiness of self-denial. And so you challenge yourself. What is your attitude to wealth? What kind of thing controls your appetite? Are you moderate? How often do you practice Ritual self denial. It's important for us to recognize that disciples were not instructed to sell their property. And so the question arises why? Why were not, they not instructed? Remember, the rich young man we encounter in Matthew 19 16 to 29. You observe there that the Lord did not instruct his disciples to sell as he instructed the young man. Remember again that passage, Matthew 19, 21, go sell. Uh -huh. He did not instruct, for example, we, from what we read in scripture, we see that Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, they were well to do. The Lord even lodged there in their, in their house and they entertained him or with the guests and all that. But then, the Lord never instructed them to sell their possession. Why? Because they had overcome the power of wealth by becoming followers of Christ. Remember what did not allow the young man and many people to come to the kingdom is their love for their wealth. So understand that 
instruction given by the Lord to the rich young man was because <clears throat> the chief obstruction to a life in Christ, you know, the chief obstruction to him, to a life of following Christ, was his love for his possessions. Yes, he confirmed the truth by turning away from Christ than selling the possessions. Matthew 19.22 The problem was not the wealth, but his inordinate love for that wealth. He wanted to hold on to it, even though he was using it in an ungodly manner. And that was why we are told he left sorrowful. He wanted to hold to his wealth and have internal life. And that could not be possible because it was not God resident in his heart. It was his wealth. And he was not going to let go of his wealth. And so the chief obstruction to a life in Christ can be a person's wealth. So for this young ruler and others like him, the most significant blessing of their lives will be the loss of their possession. You get that right. You might be asking, most significant blessing? Yes, it is the most significant blessing. Anything that will want you prevent you from entering the kingdom of God. The most significant blessing will be for you to get rid of that thing. Remember, the Lord even used hyperbole when he said, if your eyes will make you not to, then pluck it out. You know, it is letting you understand that there are situations and occasions that you need to take drastic action to make sure nothing stops you from being a member of the household of God. In this case, it was the young man's possession. And so the greatest blessing or the good, the chief blessing would have been for him to just somehow gain the power to give it away. And then being free from the power of the wealth, he will be receptive to the message of the gospel. So the best thing they can do for themselves, assuming they can get around to it, is to give their possessions away. Remember that was the last instruction. Go sell. Go and give it, sell it. If you can't give it away, sell it. Then whatever proceeds you gain from that selling, then distribute to the poor. It's still the same. Either you give the, the, the things directly, or you convert it to money and give away the money. As long as that wealth no more has hold on you. Yes, this might sound unbelievable, but the truth is, your love for your treasures will be the giant blocking your pathway to Christ. Yes, your love for treasures is the giant blocking your pathway to Christ. I know there are people who claim they are already believers in Christ. But then, check yourself. Remember, Demas, looking at Demas at some point, you would have thought he was a believer. But the Bible says that he departed. Why? Because he loved the present world. We are told in the book of John that they left. Why? Because they were not part of us. That if they were part, then they would not have left. That questions their man's uh, 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 salvation. That the potential that in the first place, he was not a genuine believer. Otherwise, wealth would not, I mean, the love of the world would not have lured him away. So please check yourself. Your love for your treasures will be the giant blocking your pathway to Christ. Well, you might even say you are in Christ, but then it could be the part, the, 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 the giant blocking your spiritual progression, your spiritual progress. You might be holding on to certain things that will better be used by others for the kingdom. So please check yourself. Remember again, 
the dominion power of treasures over their owners. The Lord was telling his disciples then, and by extension all who could follow them in believing in him down to us today, the power, treasures, and other possessions of the world have on their owners, on their possessors. Again, as we said before, no one is exempt. Treasures exert power over their owners. Where do they exert that power? In the heart of the owner. They cause the owner to develop a certain level of powerful love for, for the world that is detrimental to their spiritual growth. It is this information that first was given to them. It is first information for them to know and the implication for them. Then the command as to what they were to do. So the Lord wanted them to know or draw their attention to the existence of this entity. That it is there and the fact that they are associated with them does not exclude them. And they need to do a soul searching and they needed to take action. So he commanded them. He did not assume they would know what to do. But he gave the direct command as to what they should do and what they should not do. They should not lay up their treasures and the earth. Rather, they should lay their treasures up in heaven. Again, one can't say this enough. God is not against you having wealth. In this passage, the Lord was not saying that it is sinful or contrary to the will of God to have wealth. He was not saying that treasures are bad or that one should not acquire the goods of this world. No, far from it. So, this is not saying that one should not plan or have assets or saving accounts or retirement plans and insurance and all the other ways people plan for the future. Rather, he tells us that he knows the desires and the things we seek. Yes, that the believers, and you, you can't do nothing but to agree with the Lord, the believers seek the same things the Gentiles, the ungodly seek. So he knows we have need for them. And rather than condemning the desire for this thing, he tells his people the God-approved way of seeking them. He said his people, that's us, should first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us, the believers. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Further, we are told that it is God that gives power to get wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Also Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. So it's very important for us to get this, that the Lord was not in this passage speaking against wealth. Rather, the love that the heart of man gives to the possession of treasures and wealth. And our good God will not give us power or encourage us to get what is bad. If, if getting wealth, if getting treasures was bad, the Lord will not have given the power to get treasures. And we see on the pages of Holy Scripture, people of God who had wealth, how they use their wealth in God's pleasing ways. So we have a lot of examples to learn from. And so the question comes, remember again, where we're, talk, we're talking about wanting to do, to have peace of mind. What do we do to break the dominion of inordinate love for treasures? Yes, you need to break that inordinate love. You need to cast it behind you. 
Remember, the Lord demands to be the sole resident of your heart. The Lord broods no competitor. Mm -mm. He wants to be the sole occupier of your heart. And that is the cross of the whole matter. And so we're told, and we need to understand this. God is against you loving anybody, anything above himself. Yes, Matthew 10, 37, Luke 14, 26. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So you can put it there, he that loveth treasures, wealth more than me, not worthy of me. So it's not just human relations, but material relation. It's very, very important for us to recognize this. Remember again, the heart is at the center of the problem. Precisely, the occupant of your heart, that's the question you need to ask. I mean, answer. The occupant of your heart, is he God or other? That other could be anything, other human beings, other material things, false gods, but you alone can answer that question. Remember? The Lord says, out of the abundance of the heart, the, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34. And therefore, he goes further. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart, he bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. If I want to paraphrase that, I will say that the rich younger man, their man's, the couple, Ananias and Sapphira, out of their evil hearts, they brought love for material things over and above the love for God. So they brought evil things because they were evil. So the Lord commands again, keep, yes, scripture, remember, is the word of God. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Again, the heart is perceived as the seat of intelligence, emotions, and will. Understand this. The choices and actions of people are shaped by the things focused on by their hearts. Put another way, the focus of your heart determines the choice and action you take. Remember, the young man, because his folk, the focus of his heart was on his wealth, his choice was to prefer that, uh, to prefer his, continue to possess his possessions than to obey Jesus Christ. So his action was to turn away from the Lord sorrowfully. Is the same. Uh, uh, Achan, the focus was on wealth. He coveted riches. And so when he saw the garment, when he saw the gold, when he saw the silver, because of the focus of his heart, his choice was to desire. And his, his action was then to steal, irrespective of the command of God. It's the same for all the other examples and many more that you can come up with. Where the heart focuses is what determines the choice and the actions people take. You can't run away from it. So the need, again, to guide your heart. The need to examine what your focus is. So we need to understand this. So God is not against you acquiring treasures. He's against you allowing your wealth to take his place. 
in your heart. Yes, you need to understand that heart focus on what a person cherishes most. God doesn't want that. He wants him, he wants you to be, he wants to be the one who is the there in your heart. He doesn't want your heart to focus on your riches. So the Lord spoke straight away. Yes. He spoke straight away against treasures taking its place in your heart. Yes. Remember the stranglehold of the treasures that possess the hearts of their owners. And so you should not allow this to happen to you. Again, don't pretend. Don't claim to be strong. First admit. Is it is the truth. Remember who was speaking? It was the Lord. Who knows the truth? Pressures have strangled hold upon the hearts of their owners. And so you a believer do not allow treasures to have a stranglehold upon your heart. That's the warning of the Lord. You should not allow it, which means you have the power to not allow it to happen. And one, the first step in that why is that know and accept that you are vulnerable to the power of wealth to control its owners. Remember, the Lord did not exempt or single out the disciples. He did not say, oh, you are now my, uh, my disciples. They, 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 your wealth has no power over you anymore. Rather, he made them to know the truth. He warned them against it and he told them what to do. So, do not let pride get in your way. Rather, be humble. Accept your vulnerability and then take action. Guide, guard your heart against covetousness. Then guide your heart towards righteousness. You see there, guard, that is, you protect against. Then guide, that is, you facilitate, you encourage, you lead your heart to that which is righteous. To lead your heart to that which is godly, that which is acceptable to God. You guide your heart against that which is ungodly, against an inordinate desire for wealth. You protect your heart as guiding from it being ensnared by the love for material things. So I encourage you, heed the Lord's warning. Yes, take needed precaution. Again, remember this. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. Luke 12, 15. I'm aware that in the world, there is that misconception that what makes you a person is what you possess. And so there is the inordinate desire to possess at whatever cost. People want to have all the money. They want to have all the power. They want to be able to do. They want to, as they say, be the mover and shaker of society. In the process, a lot of heinous crimes are committed. You find that many people who people, you know, claim to be uh, um, respectable members of society, underneath their wealth and power, are horrendous uh, 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 crimes, criminal activities. Remember, recently in the in the United Kingdom, the issue of uh, 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 sexual abuse by powerful men and women in positions of trust that have abused people over the years. Yes, it is still ongoing. This is where in their days or presently 
people respected society. It's still the same. It is still happening. Do not remember in this wise of sexual abuse, no institution has been spared, both religious and secular and political. Yes, so don't try to say, oh, you are above it. Your first uh, uh, guide, your first line of protection is the awareness that you are vulnerable. The awareness that it can happen to you. Then you begin to take needed precaution. Again, you need to learn and master detachment from worldly goods. This has been the practice of believers. This is what Matthew 19, 21 to 22 is inferring. You need to detach yourself from the power of wealth and possession. Remember again, the earth is a hostile territory. Do not store your treasure in hostile territory. For it will be their good pleasure to see to it that you never see such treasures again. Even if the earth were not a hostile territory, it will still not be a place to store one's treasures. However valuable and desirous they may be, remember, one day, all earthly possessions will perish. They will be gone forever. It is thus foolish to devote one's life to something that will perish. Of all this, it's worth remembering. Yes, treasures are not the problem. Understand that neither wealth nor poverty is a sign of your good relationship with God. Possession in themselves are not wrong, neither does it mean that poverty is a blessed form of biblical Christianity. Hence, this is not about abstinence or withdrawal from possession. So you need to get that right. You cannot claim to say, oh, because you are poor, that makes you a righteous person. No. Neither can you say, oh, because of your work, God approves of your ways. Neither is a standard of approval by God. Rather, what is expected, what do are call commands is right attitude. And what's the right attitude? God foremost in all that you do. God takes preeminent position. God takes the first place. Yes, the solution is the appropriate estimate and proper use of the things the Lord has provided. That's what is meant by right attitude. Moderate your appetite. Be self-denying in areas as led by the Spirit of God. Recognize this. These things are tools. You are the one who should be the master using the tools. It should not be the tools that are mastering you. If God has graciously granted you wealth, possession or treasure, you should be the one in charge. These things are for our use and should never be estimated to be of such value as to obscure the preeminence of God in our lives. You should never be in a position where you will make decisions like the rich young woman, or like Achan, or like Sapphira and her husband. No as Demas and many others. Remember, all these things are tools. You are the one to use those tools. And what should be paramount in your use of those tools is the preeminent position of God. Remember, everything including you who has the possessions are for the glory of God. 
treasures are only safe in heaven. Your heart will be where your treasures are stored. Remember? That is a basic truth. Your heart will be where your treasures are. If your treasures are stored on earth, where they are not safe, you will not have peace. Why? Your heart will be filled with anxiety and fear. Anytime you think of your treasures or you hear of some disaster, markets and economies crashing, for example, natural and man-made disaster taking place. So do you want to have peace on earth? Do you want to have peace here on earth? Begin to store your treasures in heaven, the only place they will be safe. Yes, the one way to have peace is to store your treasures in heaven. Begin right now. You may be wondering what treasures can be stored in heaven and how to store such treasures in heaven. We shall discuss this in another video. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for all the wonderful deeds you have done for us. Let your loyal love and your faithfulness continually preserve us. We are grateful that it has pleased you to bless us in many ways and in many things. Fill our hearts with your love, so much so that the stranglehold of treasures will never ensnare our hearts. Empower us to use whatever treasures you are giving us for the interest of your kingdom, your people, and for your glory. Continue to be gracious to us and indeed our salvation in the times of trouble. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please understand, if you are not yet a believer in Christ, that only believers in Christ are addressed here in this video thus far. But you can become adopted into the family of God if you are not yet a member. Because God has been aware of you. He says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. That is God's verdict over every human being. And it goes further. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. These are God's decision and valuation over every human being. But God has not stopped there. He's aware that you cannot save yourself. No human being can pay the ransom for his own sin. And so God made provision, even while you still remain an unbeliever, while you are still running away from God. God continues to show and to demonstrate his love. Let's read Romans 5, 8 and John 3, 16. For God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, while we were sinners, God caused his son to die for us. God did not say, clean up yourself, then come, I will save you. No, he took the initiative. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I hope you understand that. God loved the world, that is the people in the world. He gave his only begotten son. So what's remaining that whosoever, doesn't matter who. Remember, all have fallen short of God's glory, all are sinners. So it doesn't matter who, but as long as they believe in the Son, they will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. So what's the way forward? 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto salvation, unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 to 10. Again, you believe with your heart, then you confess with your mouth. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. The invitation is open to all. And you have reached this far, so you cannot say you did not know. Your ignorance has been educated now. And I'm encouraging you to take the right decision. Here the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you now. Hear him. And please heed his call. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Please, I encourage you to heal, to heal, heed this call now. Do not postpone it anymore. Do not begin to, to, to give, give targets and all that. Just arise and make that decision now. Remember, a Christless life is a crisis-filled, hell-heading life on a brakeless but fast-moving vehicle. I'm encouraging you, please, you need to get out of that vehicle now before it is too late and it crashes headlong into hell. And I pray, may the Lord accept you into his kingdom as you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.